So good afternoon to you all. We've been given an hour for this round table. I am the only one who is not very much knowledgeable about universal jurisdiction. So therefore, I would like to start just by showing you or expressing my admiration for the people who are fighting this daily battle, this daily struggle. So um, with that, I mean, well, the previous panelists and as well as many people present here in this room. So if these two panelists uh, so allow me, I would like to abuse your patience, and I would like to make uh, some comments, some comments regarding the political context uh, rather than the legal context, say political context that we are facing nowadays with everything related to international justice. Well, universal uh, justice, which is the, or the role of universal jurisdiction, as well as transitional justice or the creation of uh, bodies such as ICC, or are institutions, are institutions that result from the Western system of values from the democratic grounds that well, the Western world wants to become the founding elements of an organized uh, world order, the fall of the Soviet Union and the, also the fall of totalitarian governments in the 20th century led to a world based uh, more and more on justice. If the US did not finish the war on Iraq successfully, it was just not because of the failure of their army, but because of their approach. So considering that the concept that will be debated throughout this conference result from that economic and political um, power of the Western world in the civilized world, what are the options for these concepts and these institutions to prevail, taking into account the changes that we are seeing nowadays in terms of the change of powers? And what happens with these concepts of universal jurisdiction? Will they win over, taking into account the liberal economic system that we have and the deep and systemic economic crisis that we are going through? Is it possible to have a borderless uh, justice supported by the enthusiasm of the Western world? Well. We have the right and the obligation to protect civilians that have been mistreated or abused by their states. Well, even without the endorsement of the United Nations. However, nowadays, when we are reaching the figure of 200,000 casualties and displaced in the Syrian war, we, the obligation to protect them and universal jurisdiction have reached an absolute halt. The veto of Russia and China, together with the loss of convictions on the part of the Western world, are a possible explanation. But it is not about a dichotomy between the Western world and the emerging authoritarian regimes. It is also about the contradictions within the actual Western world. World. Neither Republicans or Democrats in the US have ever suffered from excess love on the part of universal jurisdiction. And they could be neither defined as good friends of the Hague Tribunal. We could have never have thought a leader or a military a top official a trial tried in the Hague uh, court well, uh, after the Iran war or Afghanistan war. So we could have never have thought Chinese, Russians, or the British, or Dutch, or uh, Belgians also stand in trial. At the end of the day, this is a novel view of universal justice that has been kidnapped by the imperatives of the balance of power worldwide. That explains the resentment in Africa against the International Criminal Court, an instrument to their mind that helps discipline the African leaders, and then also this is also the question of the institutions and agencies of the United Nations, for instance, the Council of Human Rights, whose got its seats in Geneva. 
Unfortunately, the new rules, the new rules of international law are only enforced in those countries that are not world powers. The Council for Human Rights in of the United Nations would not have dared to take Russia to trial or China for the brutal repression of Tibet. So in the first visit to Beijing, and actually the Secretary of State at that time, Hillary Clinton, made very clear that whenever it comes to China, the old instability prevail over human rights. So you don't really go against your bankers. That's what she said. As you know, that China is the main, uh, well, offers finance, finance the wars waged uh, by the US, and actually, it finances the Pentagon. So, the US of the UK, of the UK, if they have been, well, we have never thought that they would have been asked to give testimony in trials against abusers in Afghanistan. So the 200 civilians that die after the massive bombing in Serbians in 1999 will always be anonymous. It is an important defect of this international system of law that the sublime principles of universal jurisdiction are conditioned by the balance of power, balance of political power. And the same could be said for universal jurisdiction, as has been discussed up until today, and what happened with the amendment of the law here in Spain. And all that, of course, it also depends or is explained by these political elements, but the real politics that at the end of the day prevail over the novel concepts that we that our civilization based uh, supporting our civilization well enforcing justice as such it also poses a problem in terms of transitional justice here colombia case was discussed this colombia process was discussed as you can see well well, the flagship of justice is Uribe. He says, OK, peace should be no peace without impunity. And uh, what it is being a peace process now, perhaps it will reach a formula which is different from full enforcement of justice. And the question is always the same thing. Where the balance is? Where is that balance? And that that balance could be subjected to political uh, conditions or to what could be referred as a social political context of justice. I don't really want to, uh, to talk more. Well, yesterday I was not here because, well, I couldn't make it here. But this non-professional perspective, but rather historical political view, I would like to know whether it has been approached in the, this conference or not. And because I believe that politics is what does and, and does. Uh, but in this case, I believe that it is an element that it is uh, meaningful and therefore should, be, well, should be discussed or introduced within our debates. Now, I would like to ask our panelists in terms about the role of universal jurisdiction as an element for political, social, and legal security integration for society. We have Alie Duritsky. He is the president relator of the task force of involuntary disappearances of the United Nations since 2010. He is the professor of the legal firm director of the uh, consulting group for human rights and director of the Latin American Initiative from the Faculty of Law of the University of Texas. Austin. He worked as the assistant executive for the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. And at this point in time, he is the co-executive director for the at the Center for International Law and Justice. <laughs> is that you saying it? <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so to see you. So the title of his presentation is Identifying Actors and Bosses. And two more questions that have to do with the elephant in the room nobody's talking about. And here it is. Jurist Israel's stance about universal jurisdiction in Spain taken into account, the cases that were looked into at the criminal courts such as Gaza, um, molten lead, everything. And then do you have the legitimacy to have a systematic and generally look into the human rights violations of the Palestinian people? What do you think of the return of Palestinian people safeguarded on Resolution 195? As for your first question on on enforcement of universal jurisdiction, uh, yeah, I agree that universal jurisdiction following non-national entities such as the Hague, to Hague um, Court, well, it has some political limitations. Bashir, Mr. Bashir, President of Sudan, because of Darfur's genocide, well, he remained untouched for a few years until the moment when China removed their support, withdrew, withdrew sorry, their, their support. So this court is another element of the uh, Security Council. So they cannot be touched, and their clients can't be touched either. So there are clear limitations, and that's why that universal ban or prohibition uh, fills up the void. And with all the limitations, you are suffocating the concept because it's well, not dead, but conditioned on political questions. And then on the other hand, we see how it reaches its own limitations. So, in principle, I do not oppose universal jurisdiction. It is important to further its national legitimacy. And that's what I ask the question, because it impacts in the behavior of MPs and parliaments. This is not a tool to win or lose elections. Nobody is interested. So, if there is no interest, they do not work. If it's not permeating through the fabric, the social fabric layers, well, it doesn't work. And for the other question, I would need another seminar, a whole seminar myself. Actually, I, I don't know. Well, in asymmetric wars, the typical wars that we have now, because interstate wars do not happen anymore. Well, although Putin is, is indicating that they might reappear, and also Chinese people in the East, uh, in the Middle East and the Far East, they, they show us that they could be restarted. But, but right now we have asymmetrical wars. Non state stakeholders. Do they have any responsibility? Are they to be held accountable? Uh, it seems not. I think this is the state, the rule of law, and its executors and uh, officers and uh, the military. It seems that all others are not so responsible. They are less accountable. And that's where, well, maybe during asymmetrical war, shouldn't we be enforcing symmetrical, symmetrical justice? Because operations such as Gaza or molten lead, well, uh, in principle, I'm all for the concept, but what we've done here, well, in our own way, we try to explain its scope or potential scope and how it is limited depending on conditions. Other question. Does the state have the legitimacy to systematically and generally violate the human rights of the Palestinian people? Well, no, uh, that right is not there. They are, the state is not entitled to do so. So all measures necessary need to be taken to put an end to this conflict. And we need to have a bilateral solution. 
And I agree that throughout the occupation, there have been some violations of human rights. And uh, brutally, actually. But in the root of the problem lies a political question that needs to be solved. The daily activity is a matter of human rights, but it has to be solved. And it's not for the lack of trying. And that's why. And, and you say that in your question. If Israel accepts the rights of refugees from Palestine, according to Resolution 194, when that resolution was made public in the day, well, it was not binding for chapters 6 and 7. This is the General Assembly, and it's not binding because it's not the Security Council. But let, let, let imagine it is. When it is released, the whole Arab world, including Palestinians, refuse it, reject it. And it is in Lausanne summit right after the resolution where they suggest the return of 100,000 refugees. And it is, it is a turn down. And it makes sense to try and understand the political context of everything, and also the historical context as, uh, as, as well. History is what it is. It is like the way it is. And once you missed out on an opportunity, you do not always get it back the same way. That opportunity was there back in, in the 50s. And um, then, in time, there was a time where the 194 was released. But back in the day, it had been refused, it had been turned down. And back then, there were millions of refugees, only 200,000. And so we need to understand things uh, the way they are. And this will be a political decision, because we need to see the, the, the migration of refugees along the planet. If there's been some kind of brutal conflict with lots of casualties, have they always come back to their homeland? I'm not sure. Check out Europe's map, especially uh, Eastern Europe, Balkans, and see how borders change, and the one born in Bosnia then um, is a citizen of Montenegro. So you need to find a political solution, moral remedy, moral reparation that would be favorable. We might have a time where an Israeli prime minister comes upstage and apologizes for the crimes committed in the past. That would be moral remedy, since Palestinians themselves, in, in, that's, that's what we, I can read from, from what they say. I also say, and I know it, that there is no serious Palestinian authority claiming the return of the Palestinian people. They just want the enforcement of the law. They want the acknowledgement. They, that's what they want. That's the kind of moral satisfaction that they claim. And of course, also a pecuniary uh, reparation. But it's not about return. It is out of place, actually, even from the point of view of the Palestinian people. This is very difficult. Uh, and it has a political solution with moral and economic compensations. That's it. Thank you very much.